As you probably know, this is our One Family series, and um, we're talking about different values of family. And uh, last week, Pastor Andy did a great job talking about the value of forgiveness and how it impacts our physical family and our spiritual family. After we're done in here, we'll go out and we'll experience family together out there with the barbecue and all the fun festivities, and I'm looking forward to that as well. Andy said this, and I want to repeat it today. There's something very right and very life-giving. There's something very right and very life-giving about viewing your community faith as your family. There is. It's good. It's right. We're family. Turn to your neighbor and say, we're family. Okay, for a lot of you, that's actually true. So... Uh, Turn to your other neighbor and say, we're family too. (laughs) This week, I want to talk to you about the value of growth, okay? Maturity, a life that builds toward fullness in Christ, and how personal maturity impacts and is impacted by our physical family and our spiritual family. If you have access to your Bible or a Bible app, or later you can just follow along on the screen, Uh, We're going to go into Ephesians, and we're going to look at chapter 4 today and beyond. Ephesians about seven-eighths of the way through the Bible. You'll find it after Galatians and before Philippians. It's a letter that the Apostle Paul has written to the church in Ephesus, and he did so from a prison cell. He was chained up in prison when he wrote it, which is interesting, and we'll get a little more into that later. But Ephesians can be broken into two halves. The first half... Chapters 1 through 3 are some sound doctrine about God making it clear to his people that now and forever, here and in heaven, all would be under one head, that is his son, Jesus Christ. That's what Ephesians is trying to tell us theologically. And then the second half, chapters 4 through 6, are some practical advice of how we can live out that sound doctrine. I use the word doctrine there, and I want to just go ahead and quickly define that because later it's going to come up. Doctrine is simply what we believe. Doctrine is understanding what we believe, the things that we believe, okay? That's going to come up a bit later. Today we're going to focus on that second half, that latter half of Ephesians, the the practical stuff. And before we do read, let's pray. Join me. Jesus, thanks so much for each person here. Thanks that you've got a plan for our time together today. You've been faithful to meet us here, and we ask for you to continue to do so. Lord, for each person, whatever they're bringing into this room, I just ask for an open, clear vessel to meet you, to learn, to experience you through your word. And as we unpack it, may we do so responsibly. In Jesus' name, amen. So Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 11, we'll read through 16, and it says, It was he, Jesus, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ." Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful schemes. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. The word of the Lord. Some more liturgical people or Catholics like me growing up would have said, thanks be to God. There we go. Cool. <laughs> we don't do that here, I know, but I think it's kind of cool. Let's talk about growth. The idea is that we would discover the path to maturity, the path to maturity. Last week, Andy bragged a little bit about his family, so I'm going to do take some liberty to do the same as well. Not brag about his family, but <laughs> about, about my, I could brag about his. They're very cute, but um, 
My wife of 26 years and 34 days is the love of my life. She is right there. She's the best. If, if you know her, then you agree. Uh, she's the best. Um, we've had the opportunity to raise uh, three great kids. We're still in, in the middle of it. Uh, and experience and walk with them through various stages of growth and maturity in their lives. And Isaac, who's 23, is a graduate of University of Oregon. He's now out on his own. Uh, he's, he's got a good career going. He's a great young man. Um, he was our first shot at navigating parenthood. And I'll tell you what, he taught us a lot. He taught us a lot. Maybe more than anything else, he taught us that we don't know what we're doing. That's not funny, it's hurtful. Um, <laughs> Caleb came along a couple years later. He's 21 now, and uh, Caleb's also an awesome young man. He's about to be a senior at Oregon State's Cascade Campus. So I've got a duck and a beaver. And uh, Caleb's great. He's, uh, he's doing good in school. He's got to figure out what's next. And I would like you to join me with a selfish prayer as you think about our family. Pray that Caleb would choose and be accepted to the George Fox University Physical Therapy Program, <laughs> doctorate program, so that I can see him more regularly. He's kind of like in Bend, and I kind of don't like that. So <laughs> pray with me selfishly that we can get him back here. He taught us a lot, too, including the fact that every person, every kid is way different, even if they come from the exact same people. It's amazing, isn't it? You know what I'm talking about if you've got more than one kid. Like... Genetically, there should be some similarities, but um, Naomi was much later, our third. She's, she's 15. Uh, she just got her permit to drive, warning. Um, actually, she's doing great, good um, <laughs> at driving. She's doing good. She will forever be my precious baby girl. Uh, I love her. She's teaching us a whole lot, too, um, teaching us that girls are different than boys, uh, not that we didn't know that beforehand, but teaching us in, in new ways and, uh, and that we still don't know what we're doing. That's just what it is. These are my four favorite people. They're the best. They're awesome. You know, when our kids were little, we would periodically take them to, the, to a pediatrician, right, for a, a checkup. And they would do their charting of their growth and development. This is a normal thing. You know what I'm talking about, either from the perspective of you as a child or, or parents, you've done this with your kids. And actually, it starts right as they come out the womb. Within minutes, nurses are taking them away. They're swept off to be, you know, they count 10 fingers, 11 toes, and, and they uh, start charting the growth, uh, their length and their weight, and you get that, and it's great. And then subsequent years, you get these numbers. And these numbers give you a percentile, typically, and they're measured against or alongside, here's their age, right? So. It'd take all these numbers, and then we'd, we'd get these calculations, and the doctor would say, hey, so Caleb's doing great. He's at the 97th percentile, kids his age, and I'd be in the room like, yes, A plus. <laughs> and the doctor would be like, no, it just means he's big. <laughs> oh, yes, A plus. <laughs> so, still happy about that. And by the way, it plays out. My kids are, are still probably in the 97th percentile of awesome in every way. Um, so I bring that up because the New Testament makes it clear that when we begin a relationship with Jesus, we do so as spiritual babies, right? You've heard the term born again. Salvation is a rebirth. First Peter 2 refers to it when it says, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. But I want to differentiate the two, physical growth and spiritual growth. It is apparently okay for us to chart our physical growth against the growth of other people, right? No big deal. Caleb's in the 97th percentile. Great. It would be inappropriate and judgmental for me to stand up here, like I'm starting to do right now, and judge myself against all of you and think, well, you know, gosh. I am a pastor. That's a check in my favor. Uh, not really, but uh, I'm probably in like the 89th percentile in here. Or in a more humble or maybe insecure day, I might say, gosh, these people, 
They're amazing. Everybody's ahead, except for Blake. Everybody's better than me, <laughs> you know? Uh, sorry, Blake. Actually, when I grow up, I want to be like Blake. <laughs> Stunningly good-looking, very talented, beautiful singing voice, angel. Um, anyway, we don't do that, right? We don't, we don't chart ourselves against other, other believers because that's not the appropriate thing to do. And our text just told us in verse 13 that we are mature when we attain, what? To the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So the bar isn't you and me. The bar is Jesus himself. So that should be freeing to you, not intimidating to you. That should be freeing in the sense that for the rest of your life, the train will be on the tracks that don't end until heaven. <clears throat> right? We're going to continue to mature all the way up the line, all the way through. And the bar is Jesus, not our neighbor. It's a good thing. So the question I want to answer together this morning is this. How do we know when we're maturing and growing and de developing? How can we gauge our spiritual growth as believers and followers? And so I've come up with a four-part spiritual health checklist, a checkup, if you will. We're going, going to the doctor this morning. And it comes out of this, as I said, this latter half of Ephesians. And I figure summer's a great time for evaluation and goal setting. So hopefully we'll all leave today with a tool where as we, get, as we sort of look at our spiritual development moving forward, we have something to look at it against. And so let's get our checkup started, shall we? Good. I feel like I should have like a stethoscope around my neck or something. Um, so in order to grow, one key and primary thing that we need is clarity. Clarity. What do we mean here? Well, the first evidence of developing spiritual maturity is doctrinal clarity. Remember, we talked about the word doctrine, the things that we believe. We need to be clear about the things that we believe. So in order to grow, we have to study the Bible and have a firm grasp of the basic essential beliefs of the Christian faith. We read the Bible, and not just for information's sake, but for transformation. And it requires time and undivided attention, and we <laughs> rob ourselves and we lie to ourselves if we think this is just going to happen on its own, by itself. That's not the way it works. We need to make space for the Word of God to get into our minds and our souls. I mentioned uh, Paul's imprisonment briefly, and uh, I got to tell you, I don't envy him. He spent a lot of time in, in prison. But I am struck that from prison, we get Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. And I might argue that these are maybe the most clear and sound theology in all of Scripture. And I wonder if maybe that's partly because Paul was alone and quiet. The point for us isn't get yourself put in jail. <laughs> the point is rather, what if we intentionally and regularly found some space for solitude? Maybe, just maybe, when all the distractions are gone, our spirit, where the spirit of God dwells, might come together a little bit better. So I encourage you to find that time to get away, a place free of distractions to study and absorb God's life manual for us. Read it. Learn it. And as we do, scriptural truths will become a part of who we are and a part of the way we think. And we will be, as Paul puts it, no longer infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. If we don't have that foundation, we're in trouble, right? Can I get that back? I'm going to need that later. <laughs> Trey, you're kind of the guy. You get hit with a ball, picking up cups, you're all right. We need a little bit more of a foundation. And Paul used the example of children here because, as parents know, kids are notoriously fickle, right? They'll be playing with one toy, focused on it, and then within minutes, no problem, they can focus on something completely different. Five minutes later, there's a third thing that's grabbed their attention. 
And like the wind, their attention changes. That is not necessarily unlike big people, spiritually, who, if they don't have some level of depth and clarity in their biblical understanding and belief, then we're susceptible, right? We're susceptible to being gullible or easily manipulated or attracted to the next shiny idea out there. Squirrel, right? It can happen. And the more we understand who we are in Christ and what he wants for us, the less likely we are to be blown over. And this can happen even if it involves beliefs that are contrary to Scripture. Totally contrary. It's kind of like this cartoon I stumbled upon. According to my horoscope, this is a good week to preach against false doctrines. This lady comes and says to the pastor. Right? All kidding aside, right? False teaching is ready and waiting everywhere we turn. And we just need to be aware. We need to be ready. We need to be clear. 2 Timothy 4, Paul says, and see if this seems to describe our day and age and culture at all. Paul says this, the time will come, he's talking about a time in the future, a time will come when men will put up, well, excuse me, will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Does that sound like some of our society? I mean, I'll, I'll confess, sounds like me sometimes. I'm not trying to throw stones, I'm just saying it happens. Well, how are you doing when it comes to this first measurement of your maturity? Would you judge yourself as someone who is grounded and has a pretty clear understanding of doctrine, of what we believe? Are you studying the Bible, not just for information, but for transformation? How clear are you about what you believe? Clarity is necessary and helpful. Necessary if we want to grow. The second evidence of spiritual growth is this. Unity. We've got to be clear about what we believe, and then unity is important. Say it this way. Maturing is inevitable if you have authentic relationship. Maturity is going to happen for you if you have authentic relationship. So the subtitle of this whole chapter 4 passage is Unity in the Body of Christ. And I want to say just three things about unity this morning. The first, first is this, very simple, get together, right? It's kind of hard to be unified by yourself. Get together. One key step in human development is when a child goes away from just home and immediate family relationships into a broader community. That's what happens with school, right? Kids go off to that next step, and they start coming home, and parents start seeing maturity that is new. Well, it happened because it's sort of culturally forced upon us to play well with others. And that's a step in our development as humans that can't be neglected because it develops our body, our mind, our emotions. The same is true with the family of God. We can't neglect the step of community as it does a great job of developing who we are. That's why we take this thing that we call tribes so seriously. Small groups here at our church are such a big deal because we know that we're not supposed to only focus on our personal walk with Jesus. We're not supposed to only focus on our happy little seat in the auditorium. I know you guys know this, but the group is supposed to grow. We are supposed to rub against each other and make each other better. But we mature when we get together in Jesus' name, especially if we get real together. Not just get together, but get real. So it's having a place where we can bear our souls, where we can be transparent about who we really are. And not only that, but we can be present, accepting, and supportive to others as they do the same. And as Paul says, authentic relationships involve speaking the truth in love. In other words, it's loving someone enough to tell them the truth even when it's painful. Those things help us grow and those things are also a sign that we are growing. And spiritual maturity allows people to speak the truth to us too. We know that we're genuinely maturing in Christ when we can see a brother or sister 
in the Lord who is struggling and maybe living in a way or moving in a direction that's harmful for them or for the family. And despite our fears, we go to them and we lovingly tell them the truth that they need to hear. That's love. Proverbs 27 says, an open rebuke is better than hidden love. Wounds from a friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. So I encourage you to have friends like this and be friends like this. It assures growth. And then the third thing about unity, not only we get together, not only are we real when we're together, but we get dirty together. Look at verse 16 again. It says, The whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Maturing believers know they are one individual part that fits in to the whole, the body of Christ. They know they're specifically gifted for service in the local church and in the community. They understand that this isn't a spectator sport, so they get off the sideline and they get in the game. That's what mature followers do. They're not just hearers of the word, but doers as well. So in recap, recap we, are, uh, we have clarity. We're clear. We have unity. No longer tossed by the waves. No longer blown by the wind. And when people are like that, when people know who they are and they know what they believe, and they get together and they experience community and they're authentic with each other, they are growing. And when they serve together, something magical happens when all of that is in place. It's contagious. I want to tell you a quick story, and I hope it doubles in the program as a little bit of an update on our trip to Alaska. So 10 of us just got back two weeks ago from our missions trip to Alaska. It was a great trip. For those of you that aren't aware of what we're doing there, uh, for the last 10 years or so, Foursquare has been going to southeast Alaska, to Prince of Wales Island, where there's a couple there named Joel and Trish Buchanan who do a great job of loving their community, the villages on this island. Joel is part Blinket, which is one of the Alaskan native tribes, um, and he's got a heart for what's happened to his people. And in short, what's happened to his people over the last 100 years or so is that people were taken out of their culture, out of their lives, by people that look like me and have a doctrine like me, ironically, who have come in and said, well, gosh, I think that totem pole that you've erected is probably idol worship. Because I read some things in the Old Testament about idols, and that seems like that. So let's take that down. Let's take your kids out of their school and out of their language and force them into English and force them into our culture in a boarding school. And the list goes on of things that we did out of our own naivety and misunderstanding. And as a result, we've got a people who are pushed down and uh, have been mistreated. And so Joel and Trish are doing a great job, and the family that we're a part of, Foursquare, is doing a great job of saying, let's go in and work as slowly as we need to at reconciliation. Let's restore that culture. Let's restore those relationships. Let's be better than we were. And so for the last six years, folks from our church have been going. <clears throat> for me, it was my, my seventh trip to Alaska, checking, checking this thing out and, and being some small part of what's happening there. I want to introduce you to somebody from afar. Uh, I don't have a picture, and I am going to use his name because there's no chance he's going to uh, see this message. So, uh, <laughs> When Joel, who's the main guy there, went about, about eight years ago, they started this project in a little community called Kalawak. And Kalawak is where we've done the most work cumulatively uh, with, with Foursquare Missions there. And our, our church has gone to Kalawak every year, like I said, for the last six years or so, and put in, in work in this community and, and some other towns as well. 
So we built a carving shed for the master carver to rebuild totem poles. That's really cool. We built a bell tower that used to be there and then it got torn down. The bell was found. We erected this bell tower exactly identical to the way it was. It calls people to meeting and it calls boats in. Uh, they can't see, they can hear. Pretty neat uh, native thing. Uh, they have a canoe for their tribe that was getting weathered and we built a shelter for it. The list goes on. As they were doing one of these projects, like I said about eight years ago, Joel was meeting with a guy named Les. He and Les were talking about the project. There was a, uh, some of us four square people there and a guy drives up in a ratty old Ford truck and he comes up toward Les and Joel and uh, Les says, oh, hey, Joel, I want you to meet Irving. And Irving's first words were, what the heck are you doing here? We don't need you church people. Get the heck out of my town. The only lie about my story is that he didn't use the word heck. Um, and so Joel's response right off the bat was, well, nice to meet you too, Irving. And uh, so that started kind of, kind of funny, but fast forward I'm going to tell you that, that every year, Irving became increasingly involved in what was going on when the church people, as he calls them, or the four squares, as they call us, uh, would come to town. Irving would keep showing up, and pretty soon he would start to pitch in a little bit and help. Went from observing to, to, to doing it with us. And uh, this year, the 10 of us went... We gave him a little bit of warning about who Irving is, and we all had the opportunity to meet Irving the first day we came into Kluwak. And we spent two 14, 15 hour days in Kluwak doing some fun and exciting and important work. There's a, a classroom for the master carver who is also the art and shop teacher at the school. His classroom was in disrepair, and so we were cutting out the siding and the framing, all the all the dry rot we were cutting off and sistering in new framing and putting on new siding. It's beautiful, uh, cool change was made there. First day, a couple hours in, who shows up in a ratty old truck but Irving? And uh, he's got a, a case of whatever that fake Dr. Pepper is, like Dr. Smith or whatever, <clears throat> that other one, <laughs> Dr. whatever. And uh, he was bringing his offering to, to hang out with us and, and he helped all day long. And he led us into the A&B Hall, the Alaskan Native Brotherhood Hall, so that we could have a place to go to the bathroom or sit down for lunch. And I got to know Irving. A few of us did. It was really fun. By the end of day two, two long days there, by the end of day two, I went up to Irving and I said, man, thanks so much for letting us be a part of what's going on in your town. And, and thanks for helping. Uh, Irving, you're a great guy. You're a good man. I didn't say great guy. I said, you're a good man. And uh, I went in for a little hug. <clears throat> and if, if you've ever hugged somebody or approached somebody and got that sense that, oh, not a hugger. <clears throat> that, that's definitely what I felt right then. And so it was just kind of one of these little Christian side hug maneuvers and uh, one armor. And, and uh, a couple of the gals on the trip, Gail and Judy, after me, unknowing that I had done this, after me, come to find out, pretty much said the same thing. Irving, you're a good man, and gave him a hug. Well, you can't not hug a lady, so he, he hugged, hugged them, and we went on. And we started doing a project in another community, actually on the property where Joel and Trish live, to create more housing for people like us to, to come more. So, as we're working on that one, putting in a new kitchen and stuff, or putting in a kitchen for the first time, Mid-morning, we hear this truck roll down the gravel. Ratty old truck drove an hour and 45 minutes to come and hang out with us, Irving. He comes in, I come out, turn off the saw. I said, Irving, what are you doing? He goes, oh, I just thought I'd check in on you guys, which is code for, I felt your love and I need more. Maybe I'm supposing something there, but I'm, I'm, I'm feeling pretty strong about it. So I had brought a, a firearm with me because I had a little encounter with a bear there before. <laughs> Scared of bears, whatever. Um, <laughs> well, 
Irving's really into guns, and I knew that. So I said, Irving, I want you to check out my gun. I don't, I don't really know anything about it. I want you to kind of give it your, your approval, which was mostly true. So I probably shouldn't own one. Um, <laughs> so I brought him into where I was staying. I said, oh, check it out. And, you know, he's checking it out. Oh, it looks good. And he said, will you come out to my truck with me? I said, sure. <laughs> Guns, come out to my truck. <laughs> no. Came out to his truck, and um, he goes, uh, he goes, I want you to see something. He showed me his guns, and he's got these beautiful guns, beautiful. And uh, it was like he was showing me his children. It was just <laughs> awesome. I said, man, that's great. So cool. And we went about our day. A week later, the group is leaving. We're at the Cloak Airport to get on our little puddle jumper flight. And who drives up in a ratty old truck? Irving. He's got a fresh haircut, a shirt that's a little less dirty than the other ones. And I'm going to shorten this story with this. Irving initiated a hug with every single one of us to say goodbye. Yeah. Yeah. Not a hugger. And that's not a pat on our back. It's just simply to say that when we know who we are, and we love each other, and love being together, and when we serve and get dirty together, there's something about it that's stable and attractive and infectious. The third evidence of growth is purity. Great maturity requires great commitment. Let me explain what I mean by purity here. Lori and I went on one of our favorite dates a few years back, and there was a jeweler here in town that taught classes on how to make jewelry. So we, would, we brought in uh, some old silver things that we had and sort of offered them to make something brand new with. And so they went to a, into a crucible, they were melted, impurities were, were melted away or separated out, and now we've got this pure liquid silver. And then you cool it, mold it, shape it, detail it, and then use it. And in my case, you use it on your hand. These are, I made a couple of those. Um, these are my kids, by the way. Isaac, Caleb, Naomi. A lot of people go, that guy's got a lot of rings. <laughs> but that is. <clears throat> the illustration's pretty self-explanatory. But suffice it to say that there are moments or markers in our life, in our journey with Christ, where we bring him our old stuff. Whether it's junk to us or whether we consider it very valuable. And we say here, we offer it to him for something brand new. And it's then that he melts and molds and shapes and details and uses us. This process is laid out in Ephesians chapter 5, the next chapter there, as one of sacrifice. Lord, here's me, the stuff I can't wait to give you and the stuff I really don't want to give you. But here it is. And then submission. I come under your leadership. You're in charge of my life. Jesus, take the wheel, right? And then obedience. I will follow you, and I will do as you say and go where you go, when and how you want me to go there. And obedience comes into play when we don't actually just make the decision about it, but we do it. And if we're willing to do these things, we'll be transformed and pure for usefulness. And we will experience full life. And a life like that might even overflow. Stay. The fourth and last thing is stability. Ephesians ends with a picture which I can only assume Paul got while he was in prison looking at who might have been the only person he would see all day and that would be a Roman guard, a Roman soldier. He saw this armor and from it, he got this idea of the armor of God. And I encourage you, if you're going to go away and get clear about your doctrine, one thing to study might be the armor of God. We certainly don't have time to do it today. But Paul wants the church in Ephesus, and Jesus wants Red Hills, Red Hills Church in Newburgh to be protected and stable and ready. Protected and stable and ready. Armor. Chapter 6, verse 13 says this. You may recognize it. Put on the full armor of God 
so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand. After you've done all these other steps, then mature and maturing, you can stand firm in the battle with clarity, unity, and purity. We can be confident that we have stability and we'll be able to stand against the enemy of our soul, the enemy of those that we love as well. I'd like to ask you to stand to your feet with me as we close.